Good afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to this afternoon session on learning more about the public library system redesign process. Here today to lend clarity to uh, <laughs> the, the year and a half long process thus far are John Thompson, Director of the Indian Head Federated Library System and Chair of the PLSR Steering Committee, and Teresa Schmidt, Director of the Mercer Public Library and Facilitator of one of the work groups for the PLSR process. Won't you please give them a warm welcome. Okay, so we, we obviously got introduced. I'm terrible. A couple of people know me in the audience. I'm terrible at doing these things in terms of following the script up here. So just bear with us. We're gonna we're winging it today. But um, like Marla said, I am chairing the steering committee. So um, this process is something that was a, a result of a lean study that was done by the Department of Public Instruction about library systems. And this morphed into this um, system redesign process. It is a community-driven process. We are getting feedback from this group. That's why we're here. What we're showing today is actually a toolkit for you to take back to your boards and use with your library board and answer all their questions. Most likely, you're not going to be able to answer all those questions. Um, we're going to give you some information at the end on how you can contact either the steering committee or the project managers of the work groups to get you know, follow up on those questions that you can't answer. So we're, we are looking at systems from a service perspective. We are not looking at it from a geographic perspective at this point. We are trying to figure out what are the services that are best or Wisconsin libraries, and then figuring out how we are going to deliver those services, whatever models that we may have moving forward. This committee was appointed by the Department of Public Instruction State Superintendent, so we are all officially vetted by the state. In fact, they actually did background checks on us before we could actually get appointed to this committee. The appointments um, for all of these folks here Everyone represents a different type of library or different type of organization, size, geographic area within the state. John DeBacher is the DPI liaison to our steering committee. I represent large systems in Wisconsin. As many of you know, Indian Head has 10 counties and 53 public libraries. So we are one of the largest systems in the state. Steve Owes is the director of Lakeshores. He represents a smaller system that has a couple of libraries in there. Paula is the director of Milwaukee Public Library, so she represents the largest resource library in the state of Wisconsin. Um, Bridget represents a smaller library. When Beth was appointed, she was representing Kimberly Littleshoot, which is a joint library. She has since left there and is now working at Appleton Public, but she brings all that experience from Kimberly Littleshoot now she also has that perspective from Appleton as well. Christy is from the City County Library. Kent is from Wild Rose, which is a very small library. <coughs> Jessie Lee Jones is Director of Fleckel. She is a resource library for her system in the southwest part of the state, kind of, in the sense that they are, they are the largest library in their system, but they do not meet the state definition for a resource library in terms of the size. So they also have a relationship with Madison Public for some of their other stuff. So she has a different perspective. Brian McCormick is also a um, resource library. He also sits on COLAN, which is the Council for Library Network Development. So he reports back to them on their regular meetings. And John Mark Bolthouse, who is Director of Fond du Lac Public, he represents that kind of large library that's not a resource library in the state of Wisconsin. So we've tried to get everybody involved there, and then the work groups have further diversification from there. The appointment for this process was a three-year 
appointment or until the process is done. So I'm either going to be retired or <laughs> it won't be done in three years. Um, it won't be done in three years. No. Nor will I be retired. But um, it is it's something that the department feels very in, in, um, strong about. For those that were at WLA, we had a Q&A session from the steering committee. Uh, Dr. Evers was actually in the audience during that Q&A session. So that's how invested he is in this process. We've also made one report to his cabinet already. We're planning on doing another report sometime in the spring. So this is being watched not only by the library community, but by the DDI staff. We are funded as a uh, process by LSTA grants. Right now we're in phase two of LSTA funding. It's about $120,000 next year. For phase three, we'll be at about $150,000. Um, our library system happens to be the fiscal agent for that as well, but that's how a lot of the meetings and all that stuff is being paid for. And the project manager, um, we have hired Wills to do that for us. We sent out a national RFP to see who we could get to help facilitate this process. We had two uh, submissions, and the steering committee chose Wills to, to do that, and they've been doing a great job for us. As we mentioned, this is a community-led process. We have over 100 different individuals from across the state involved in this process. While the vast majority of them are public library staff and system staff, we do have folks from the university and schools that are part of these work groups as well. So there, there is a broad group of people that are in there. We have different nine different work groups, and they are dealing with a, a variety of different subjects, and I think you said that you're trying to say what we're um, I don't know yet. <laughs> <laughs> we're we're winging this. I kind of talked about some of this, but these work groups have individuals on them that are not only experts or you know, providers of services, we also have individuals that are on those work groups that are receiving the services. So. They're providing that perspective as well. We have leads and facilitators that don't necessarily have to know about that subject area. They are good facilitators or work group leaders to keep the group on task. Each one of us as steering committee members are on one of those work groups as a liaison back to the steering committee. And then we also have a DPI staff person that's part of that work group as well. These work groups were created by Wills and they report directly to Wills. They're not a reporting group back to steering. So they do their work for Wills. Okay, so um, I am the leader of the ILS Discovery Committee for this, and I, um, as you know, I'm from Mercer. The Mercer Public Library is a very, very small library. We have 1.8 staff at Mercer. So, um, and then we also have members who are um, system staff, IT people, um, directors. So we have a sort of a wide range of representation. But we recognize that we don't know everything, and so we've been relying a lot on gathering information from other places, um, looking at other the way ways that other states and other systems and other organizations are doing their work. Um, and so we've relied a lot on out-of-state information gathering. We've had a lot of conference calls with um, state library staff and other organizations from other states to see what they're doing in terms of their service areas. A lot of those meetings have been attended by multiple different groups. So we would get, say, a group from Michigan on the phone. And there would be people from my committee, there would be people from interlibrary loan, there would be people from delivery, um, and so on, asking them questions about how they do things in Michigan. Um, there have been a number of those kinds of phone calls. A lot of that information is on the field on our website if you really want to get down into the details. In state information gathering, we've done a lot of surveys of systems and of libraries. Um, we've looked at some of the things that have happened in the past, such as the Project WIN, which I recognize a lot of you from. I was on the technology committee for that. And then encouraging the work groups to talk with others. A lot of those work group service areas have a lot of overlap. Our, our committee in particular, we're finding a ton of overlap with our work and interlibrary loan and delivery and e-resources. Um, so there, there has been some discussion between those work groups. There will be a lot more coming up in the future in terms of work groups that people will integrate into our event. Um, so the intent of the process is to develop new models of service. 
we were the first thing we did was establish our desired service outcomes. And what we were told to do was pretend we don't know anything about how libraries work today and what would be the best kind of service we could offer patrons and libraries and communities for these areas. And that's how we developed our desired service outcomes. And um, I can't speak to every work group, but I know our work group constantly comes back to those and says, if we did this, will it meet those service outcomes? Will it really tie back to what we're trying to achieve here? Not based on what we've always done or what you know we've seen Michigan do or you know Denver do or whatever, but is it really achieving those service outcomes? So that's where we're supposed to be tying all this work back to. Um, we did develop outlines of our models for the WLA conference, and if you were there, you saw that there were posters up for each of the work groups, except for resource libraries. They had a poster up because resource libraries are their, their committee is discovering that the way Wisconsin does that is completely different than anybody else in the world. So they're really still in an information gathering and modeling stage. The rest of us have come up with some um, outlines of models. They are by no means complete. Um, those models will be put onto the TLSR website very soon. So the images of those posters, along, along with some more explanatory information, we've been asked as a work group to either provide a written explanation or some kind of recording that explains those models in a little bit more detail than is what that's just what's on the poster. Um, and we all were told to start with no preconceived notions. And again, I can't speak for every committee, but for my committee, I don't think when we started, we thought we would end up where we are with our model. It's different than I anticipated it being. I think it's different than a lot of our groups anticipated it being. Um, and that's, a lot of that, again, is based on that data that we were gathering and the feedback we were um, we are still looking for community feedback, so there are ways for you to do that. I think in a future slide we'll talk more about that. And um, the next step really is for us to start creating some implementation plans. So that's just going to take us into 2017. Yeah, so the process is going to continue at least through March of 2018. It is a time-consuming process. You guys have been working on this for a lot longer than I have. I feel like I've been working on it for a long time already. Um, it is not something that we're rushing into, and there's a lot of reasons for that. First of all, it's really big. Secondly, we really want to be communicating with all the libraries in the state, um, because the last thing we want to have happen is for a year or two years from now, for your boards to say, well, we didn't know about this, or you, know, you should have thought about that. We really want this process, now is the time for you to be learning about it, for you to be educating your boards about it, for good or for bad, so you could be in giving us feedback about what you're seeing and what you're hearing about the process. Because if you do that now, there's time to get it worked into the, into the system. If you do it two years from now, it's not going to be as helpful for us in terms of building what the community really needs to be happening for good service, or for you know, serving their community. Um, so the overall administration and implement implementation work will happen after March of 2018. The next thing our committees have been told is the beginning of January that we're going to start working on information and implementation plans for our specific topics. Um, so there is still a lot of time that's going to be happening for this. So we have to follow along and offer feedback. The website has a lot of information. Um, every committee that has had the meeting was meeting notes on that website. The meetings are generally recorded if they're available online, if they were online meetings. So those full recordings are on the website. They do, um, go ahead and put them in because, yeah, there's a blog there. They, there is a contact form that you can fill out. And then when you offer that feedback, it's disseminated to whatever committee is most appropriate for it, or sometimes multiple committees. Um, events and schedule of our meetings are on there. All those notes and recordings that I talked about, and then email um, for the overall project and contact information for each one of the work, work groups is located on that website also. So there's a lot of ways that you can reach out to us, um, whether it's the steering committee or the individual work groups or wills as an organization to offer your feedback and ask questions. So the toolkit is for you to use um, to share this information with your board, and your staff, and anybody else that you think is, is, needs to know about it. This slide deck is in it. There is a script. It's not an idea to follow, but you can if you need to. <laughs> Pretty much how we walk. Um, and then there are a couple of handouts with contact information as well as um, the basic uh, 
what PLSR is and how it started. So the basic handout is pretty much a bullet point in a nutshell. The other contact information is on here. The posters that Teresa was talking about, they are all posted now. I just wanted to check. They are up on the work group's individual website, so there's a snapshot of those posters. The recordings or script from those things have not been posted yet, but these are posters. And I think there's some of the workers like mine are still working on that. Um, at, at WLA, we didn't have anything prepared because we had representatives there to talk to people and answer and ask questions. So we didn't have anything in writing. We will soon. Okay. Any other questions that actually came up uh, just recently? We send out the communication uh, recommended by the and there's a lot of information in those posters. There's a lot of information on the website. If you're from a little library, it's pretty hard to pull all the pieces of what's happening together. This is a huge process with a lot of moving parts. If they can obviously visit the website, they can register for updates via the blog. Is there some way to just sort of streamline this for them going forward to help them keep up to speed with what's happening with each work group. Do you know of anything at this point? Or it's a real challenge for The easiest way for them to keep an eye on what's going on is to really look at the Part of, part of the problem or challenge with this process is that the technology work group is here, but that also impacts electronic resources, the ILS, which then in turn impacts delivery, which then impacts this. So what's really going to happen in this next phase between now and March of 18 is each work group is going to put their implementation plan on paper, but they're going to do so interconnected with the other groups. So there will be more connectivity with that, so it might be, hopefully it will be easier for them to grab and go some of this stuff. Um, when this whole implementation plan is kind of in a wrap stage, when it's all melded together before it becomes an official document of Steering committee going to the state superintendent. There will probably be some other kinds of information sharing kinds of things. Um, the other piece that they can kind of hear about what's going on in the individual work groups are there's some virtual Q and A's out there, so they can listen to those or actually be part of that group and hear from each one of the work groups. So there was one already prior to WLA from the steering committee DPI perspective, and that's out there and that's recorded. There, each of the other work groups have a slot scheduled, so if you can't attend that, at least be able to listen to it through the recording basis. That'll give you a better nutshell and give you more of a synopsis of what's going on. Yeah, I'll, I'll say that it is really a challenge, and I'm from one of those small libraries, and I know that how much do you need to, you know, what's the bare minimum I need to know right now? That's really what they want to know. They don't even have time to read right. all this stuff. Um, and I think because it's still early in the process, even though we've been doing this for a long time, a lot of the time that the workers are put in is still all that information gathering stage. And even as a worker member, it's really information overload. We gathered a lot of information, had a lot of discussions with people. Um, as John said, as we get a little further into these implementation plans and we start working towards fitting these pieces together, I think it will be easier for you and for your boards to get your mind around some of the things we're talking about because right now they are somewhat disconnected from each other in terms of, you know, what's the best way for us to provide this service is one question. How do we get from where we are now to that best way is the other question. And so those implementation plans, I think, are going to help that process. Um, so it, as they keep telling us from Will, it's okay to say,
say it's early in the process, we don't know that yet. Um, and really, that feels like a little bit of a cop out, but it's not because there's a lot of questions we really don't know the answer to. So I'm hoping that as we get further into the implementation stage, things will become a little more clear for you as we report. Um, I think the blog is actually pretty helpful, at least in terms of knowing what activities have been happening. You may not know the details of what we're talking about in each committee. And I don't know that it's important. It's not a, I don't think it's important for my board to know the details of each committee's work. But I think it is important for them to know that this process is happening and these are the topics that are being examined and that um, you know, there's likely to be some change in the future around these topics. So, so. I, this might be a little hard for you to see, and I don't know if the end can pull up you know, it's our website. But this little light shaded green piece, this is where we are right now. We've done all the first three orange pieces. We've done two of the darker green pieces. We still have two more darker green places to go, three more yellow places, and then when we get down there, then we have to mesh this all together. So we really, truly are at the beginning of this process. So that diagram is on the very front page. You can see all that got our dot info. I have it on my computer, but it's not on the screen. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> So I'm not sure what I do. Other questions, comments, feedback? Did she ask too many questions? Or conversation. We're getting close. <laughs> In the last communication that went out, or did you want to go ahead? I guess, what are some key talking points that you want us to share with the library board? Um, you know, I, I love the fact that you gave us good slides to share. Um, yeah. And but I, I think my library board would be a little overwhelmed with that. No. So are there any key points, or is there a spot on your website with you know, five key points you want us to share? So there's a handout here that's, that's bulleted that's part of that piece. This is kind of the process in the nutshell right now. Okay. So if you wanted to give them something plain and simple, this would be the option here. Basically what this process is looking at is how we're providing services to libraries. We're ignoring all the geographic things that exist now. We're ignoring everything that's been talked about in the past. They're using those resources to help inform them, but nothing. There's been some things out there that said, well, this is what we should do. You know, I think for a while there was the we should just have one library card in the state of Wisconsin or one ILS. All of that is background information. There's no preconceived ideas going into this. What, what we're really looking at trying to do is equalize service across the state. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick on Northern Waters because they're easy to pick on. Um, their <laughs> business manager recently retired. That person, that one person, was responsible for youth services, special services, um, fiscal management, um, interlibrary loan. I think there was a backup delivery person and consuming education. I mean, there was yes, so there were six or seven things that this person was responsible to do when they retired. Well, how do we, how do we find somebody that can do all of that? <laughs> Um, it's virtually impossible. But many of the things evolved and things that were added were added to the staff that had capacity. Every system evolved different ways and some libraries get all kinds of different services and some libraries get very few. So we're trying to figure out what is that best model for everybody across the state. So that's really one of those take homes is we're looking at service to you so that everybody has equitable and fair service across the entire state. That's one of the reasons I think with the research library group is, I won't, I won't say they're struggling because they're not, but they are, are finding it a challenge to come up with models because even within the state, what a resource library provides to the system is drastically different. And what system services are from system to system are really different too. And I think some of that we didn't, at least I as a small library director, no, I didn't know that the services provided by Wisconsin Valley were so much different than Northern Waters, were so much different than Indiana, and so on, all across the state. So um, 
I think that's, I mean, that really is the heart of it, is trying to figure out, you know, why are we doing things the way we're doing them? How are they prone into these strange hybrid positions like poor Linda from Northern Waters was um, over the years? And, and is that really the best way to do it? You know, it makes <coughs> sense for her to be spending two hours a week on the
our communications go out to multi-type trustees, library directors, and staff. So there's this interest from any of those schools. And that's okay. So this is okay. Yeah, and, and all of you have board members that may have an area of expertise that's beyond libraries. Maybe they've got technology issues, or maybe they're, they're hardcore um, OPAC users. And, and they're frustrated with how materials go back and forth between systems. So they have a perspective from, from the, the trustee patron side. We've got, we've got it. We're scheduled for another hour and a half. <laughs> so unless you want to hear me start singing. Um, I have a question. I might be the only person here that, um, I'm, I'm the president of the Board of Trustees for the Denver Library. And I know Eric and I are going to have to present this at some time to our board. And our board is very engaged and also, I guess, very skeptical questioning of changes. They'll change, but they want to know why. But they don't want to do a whole lot of work. Because <laughs> <laughs> they're busy people, right. you know? They're just, they're just they're they're a lot of work that they're doing a lot of work. And so, um, I'm thinking, how do we present this to them? And if we present as what we heard here today, there's, there's just going to be like 20,000 questions that we're not going to be able to answer. But I know one of them will be, I really like, I think what you're doing is great, and it needs to be done, and grand things are going to come of it. Um, the intent of the process is to develop new models of service in order to implement change the system as we know them today. So if change is hard, the change is good. I know what they're going to ask is this is because they're cutting the budget and they're seeing how they can reduce services to cut the expense to the system. Oh, my question to you is, is there any um, direction given as far as what the cost of these changes will be? Or are you going to worry about that like when you get down to the implementation stage and say, oh, that's just right. And I will say from the work group perspective, when I'm involved at that steering level level committee, um, from a work group perspective, we've been told to not really think about that, to really think about what's the best service, and that we'll worry about how to, how to make it happen later. Um, does that mean they haven't had any talk about it? No, all it done. Yeah, I'm wondering if there's but direction from, a, from the DPI. Right. From a work group perspective, we've been told to develop our model not really considering cost or cost savings at all. We're really told to, to consider what's the best way to provide service. And for us, as ILS and Discovery, what we've looked at across the state is all the duplication of service that we're seeing from all these little ILSs and all these companies, all doing pretty much the same stuff. Um, so there, to me, there are other ways to be more efficient. That doesn't necessarily mean be less costly, um, because to provide quality service, we still probably are going to lose all those people. But um, at least at a work group level, we're told don't think about that now. Think about what's good service now. I'll let John add his perspective. We have no directive from the state superintendent about a dollar target. Our assumption as a kind of within the steering committee is that we have a pot of money that is allocated for library systems in the state of Wisconsin. For the last five years or so, six years, it's been pretty much the same amount of money. Whether or not we get a little more or not down the road, we don't know. So what we're really focusing on is saying, okay, are we taking the dollars that we have and using them most effectively to provide service across the state? Um, Kenosha um, 
funding for the library system. They receive state funding. There are two libraries in Kenosha County, Kenosha Public and some joint library. No. I can't. Community library is what it is. They get state money to provide library services. We get state money to provide services for 53 libraries over 10 counties, over approximately 8,000 square miles. 8, I mean, 80,000 square, 8, square miles. There's a huge disparity in terms of size and, and service. We, have, we as systems are required to do certain things by state statute in order to receive that money. One of those is to provide continuing education. There are approximately 15 individuals that are identified to provide CE organization across the state of Wisconsin. Many of you have taken advantage of the webinar series that Jamie and Jean have put together, either for the trustees or for the public libraries. They put those all together for everybody in the state of Wisconsin. All we ever do as a system is write them a check. So we're not, they're doing great things collaboratively. That can be strengthened. We may not need those 15 people designated to do that. We, we you know, we as, as a system are sharing resources now for technology with your system. We haven't eliminated any staff, but we've built in staff redundancy now. So when Josh goes off and becomes a dad, you guys are, you know, without a network engineer, there's some backup there. When our, you know, when our staff is on vacation, we have backup help desk support. So there's that interplay. I think there was a talk about you hosting the ILS board in the Northern Water that are not done a deal yet. So we have a data center that we're sharing and, and we're inviting other people to be part of that. So that's kind of that change that we don't necessarily need you know, four sets of servers or three libraries. We, we can use one server house and, and, and share things like that. Um, we may not need 17 library system directors across the state. Um, some of you probably were at the Q&A. Um, one of the things I said as part of that Q&A is I'm in charge of a process that's community driven that ultimately may result in me not having a job. And I'm okay with that. Because what this process is designed to do is make services better for everybody in the city of Wisconsin. It's not about my job. It's about how we provide services to folks. And we're not looking at it to save money. We're looking at it to make things better so that you can serve your patrons better. We don't we are so much more connected now than we were in 1970 when these organizations were created and the basic framework was put in place. So we need to change and evolve to make it better and take advantage of technology. Orders are starting to disappear. We're interconnected by delivery across the entire state of Wisconsin. Can we make it better? Does it make sense for stuff from Northern Waters as part of the statewide delivery network to go all the way from Superior all the way to Madison and back to Eau Claire when they drive right by our door? Does it make sense? We, the two of us, our two systems have an advantage because we share the same courier system. So they at least can do some things used to be able to do some things. In a relatively seamless manner. Um, but South Central has a statewide delivery network, but they subcontract with somebody else to go that last mile up to Northern Waters just because of the distance. So that's, you know, does it make sense to be moving things all over the place? Like that. So it, it, it makes, could cost more. For that piece, something else may cost less, but the dollars are going to just be shifted. 
So we're not we're we're not really saying okay we have to go a million dollars we have to do this we're, we're really looking at it. and ultimately those cost ideas and governance models are going to be discussed at the steering committee that's going to be part of the recommendation steering makes to the state superintendent so it's going to be up to the steering committee before any of that's done from the point of going to steering to the state superintendent there will be more discussion there will be some more public information pieces out there. And steering is just starting to talk about that. That's going to be at the end of phase three, which is around that March of 18 time frame. Hopefully a little sooner before that. But once that March 18th thing is it's going to be in phase four and it's going to be implementation conversations and figuring out is it going to be cost effective to do what we think we should do? Are we going to have to phase some of it in? Are we going to have to look for some additional dollars? Are there dollars? in the DPI or resources within the DPI that we can reallocate or use just you know, part of a school system or something like that. So they've got school specific money that does similar type of purposes that public libraries need. Can that pot of money be opened up to allow public libraries? Those are all conversations that are going to be part of this process. And with that, is that the best way of discovering information? There's a lot of resources involved there. Can that be shifted to something else? So we're really we're really ignoring dollars at this point. Just really looking at sense. That's a good question that you brought up with tech. Will this will be the end of this question, I imagine? If you want to do it. If you mm -hmm. open it opens everybody up to the whole city with content, you can go, you know, they see the book at Madison mm -hmm. Public Library and it's available, they're gonna say one that going to eventually show up in Well, I mean, so this eventually this will phase out with I, I don't want to say that it's going to phase out with cap. I think that with cap would probably look very different. Um, my, my committee is ILS and Discovery, and our model as it stands right now is for a statewide discovery layer where patrons can access. And ideally it will be sculpted well so that you can see what's in your home library, what's in your system or region or whatever we're going to county, maybe, I don't know. And then if you really can't find it in those areas, now let's look larger. Um, and so so yeah, the idea is for the pay, on the patron end, it's seamless. But on the back end, somebody's got to run that discovery layer. It's not a simple matter to integrate all these resources into that discovery layer. So so maybe one of those cases is that WISCAT doesn't exist as an autographic WISCAT product, but if those resources are reallocated to a discovery layer, that's prettier and easier for our patrons to use. Um, and then there goes so another cost. That would be split up whatever. It there, wouldn't be gone. dollars that could be shared into a different yeah. 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 Right. And so part of that, of course, is my group integrating with what interlibrary loan is talking about. And delivery is a huge factor of that. Yeah. So that's a case where, you know, maybe WISCAT looks different. Maybe we don't call it WISCAT anymore, but there's still going to have to be resources allocated to making this product usable. Right for patrons and the libraries that serve them. So, yeah, and I don't see it's going to cost less than this. Yeah. <laughs> WISCAT is available not only to public libraries but also the school districts. So, <laughs> trying and trying to figure out how all this mesh together and it may or may not be on the scope of all of this, but you know, it's still a DPI function. So they yeah, and it might be just a formula like the same kind of formula we have for overdrive based on your population, your situation, that, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. We haven't, we haven't figured out costs. Okay. Stuff. Well, that's what the board asked all the time. Yep. Yep. Well, I mean, that's what we're doing project win. That's the first question that came out. How much more do you think cost of it? You know, well, because we're already looking at tight, 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 but every year it's tighter and tighter. And, uh, you know, if you have to cut your materials budget in order to pay for your health insurance, <laughs> you know, um, yeah, it's a nightmare. And, and, and different systems across the state charge for different types of services. So while we, all three of our systems charge, a, a lot of it mainly for the ILS piece of it and, and some courier costs depending on the system, there are other systems that there's technology costs and there's other costs that are are part of their budget and they're they can be relatively significant. So 
trying to that's where some of those dollars getting shifted may make a baseline service free. Whereas if you go up to another level, it may cost you, but you can opt in or out of that kind of service. So that's why all these service models have to be refined and meshed together. And then once we put costs on them, then we'll figure out where, where we're at with it. Who charges it to assign costs? Is that the steering committee's charge or DCI's or what? There, part of phase three will give you will have some sort of the work groups will try to determine if there's some sort of cost associated with it. Okay. But but it's gonna what they want to try to do is do as close to the nickel as they can in terms of cost estimating of what this may cost. So you know, if they develop a new delivery model, what is it going to cost overall? And then, and then they'll look at it and say, okay, this isn't reasonable. We need to do something a little different. And then eventually they'll be you know, go out to the state superintendent. Um, I guess kind of piggybacking because we sort of started with that a little bit of time. Can you share um, some anecdotes from these work groups? I would think that you've learned, without reading through all of basically, um, <laughs> things that you've learned either from talking to Michigan or Denver or Seattle or wherever, or things that you've seen that have jumped out from the work groups. That, I, you know, I, I admit I breathed by the table at WLA and saw all the posters, but there's a lot of fine print in it. I'm just kind of looking for some, you know, what are the big things? Um, well, for, for our community, I guess the, the biggest thing that keeps coming up is how different everybody is. Everybody has a different approach to, make, to providing their services. Libraries everywhere need to get stuff to their patrons, right? But the ways that they do that are hugely varied. And even within the state, as we learned in Project Win, even if you say, all right, let's, let's share an ILS, well, how do you govern it? How do you fund it? How do you do policy? How do you all these questions that come up that when I started on this committee, I imagined I would have to learn a lot about data protocols, you know, um, ILS technology and so on. And that's been very little part of my job. The questions we're getting from people are governance and funding. Who controls it? Who sets the policies? Who pays for it? And, and that's, that's what it comes down to for your library board. I mean, when I mean, first did Project Win, it was, we don't want to lose local control. That was from my county board representative. Right. We don't want to lose our local control. Um, how many of our items were in Netlender now? How many more items are going to go out? Which means less items on our shelf for our own people? Is that going to be sold somehow so that that's more equalized out? You know, and those are, those are the three main questions. Yeah. Was the, the lending, um, the local control, and of course the cost. The first thing he said was, well, how much more is this going to cost? That was my county person. <laughs> well, and when I think back 15 years ago when we formed Merlin, which is what we call our shared dollars and Northern Waters, it was the same questions. We're talking about the same questions now that we were talking about 15 years ago. And I, I remind my board, we had that conversation, and this, this is the result that we have today. Um, and I'm not saying it's not going to change, but what I'm saying is it wasn't an impediment to progress then, and it shouldn't be now, even though there, there may be some change. So I think um, the other thing that I've seen from a lot of work groups is comparing the work of libraries to the work that other services do for our patrons. You know, we're competing, if you will, I hate to use that word, but we are. We're competing with Amazon, we're competing with Netflix, we're competing with services that our patrons, a service level that our patrons expect. And some of them are willing to deal with low delivery because it's free, and others will say, no, I'll just go buy a copy or I'll just download it from Amazon or whatever. Um, and so a lot of our work groups, it seems to me, and I hate to speak for all of them, I really can't because I'm only really invested in mine. But a lot of us are saying, you know, what's the best result for our patron? They don't care how it works in the back end. They don't care who decided if DVDs loan for seven days or 14 days. They just want to know that it works and that, that they can find their stuff. So I think starting our process with those service outcomes is the best way for us to keep reminding ourselves of that. To say, we're not here to say who, you know, my item to staples for the copy machine or whatever. We're here to make sure that the patron is getting a good experience. So they keep coming back in the door. So we still have an opportunity to impact their lives. Um, 
So in many cases, that involves looking at models outside library land, you know, and I think delivery is doing that, especially with their proposals for much quicker delivery and different ways of doing hubs to make things move around faster when they need to. But also, I love discovery in that, in, in trying to find things that are more efficient to get to your patron. Why should my patron have to get it from Superior when it's in Manaqua, you know, 15 miles from me? And why should it have to go from me to Ashland to Madison back to, to Wausau to Manaqua? You know, so it's those kinds of questions really coming back around to what is the best for patron service. Because patron service is why we still exist. If we don't do that well, who cares who governs it, you know? Patrons won't be here to do it. As part of this discussion, are you also um, trying? Are you also examining those models and how libraries might use them? You know, besides looking at what Amazon as as a competitor, right? You know, right. And, and like UPS, yeah. how do they decide what gets delivered by drone or what gets delivered by van? I can't do that. You know. Uh, is that is that discussion happening as well? Looking at other um, systems that aren't libraries, mm -hmm. I think it is. I mean, I don't. We haven't gotten on the phone with Amazon, for example, but I really think it is. Um, at least in terms of ILS and discovery, we've been talking very much about you know, well, how does that work? How do they how do they make that happen? We know the software exists. We might be able to afford it, but how could we make something that's going to achieve a similar result? or at least a good enough result for our future. We have to look at that. Yeah, and like the delivery <coughs> network, the person that manages Self Central's delivery network actually came in from the logistics side from Walgreens. So he's he's had both sides of that equation. Bruce Smith, who is at Will now, used to run Self Central's delivery system. He co-authored a book on delivery um, and looked at different models across the state. So there's a huge amount of in-state knowledge already, but yeah, they're going to, you know, they're looking at a hub model that may replicate more of uh, what a Walmart distribution network looks like versus, you know, 17 networks of library systems that, quite frankly, most of their headquarters are in the big city where the resource library is and not necessarily where hub is. the hub, hub yeah. needs to be yeah. or right. where it makes sense for everything else. So. Yeah. And if they, they know of something from outside the library, good to have them there because you're both involved with Project Manitou. And one of the things that we took away upon reflection after Project Manitou uh, discussions and notes and everything was the one big missing component, which was comparison. Um, offering a very clear comparison of the state of the now versus the state of the predicted or the state of the then. Uh, we were focused so much on just building the state of the then and looking at the values in it. And, uh, many of us that were working on it very closely or directly could see those value differences, but it wasn't, that wasn't articulated or presented across the membership in a way that really was meaningful. Is that something that is going to be there? Not asking for specific costs or cost comparisons, but that <laughs> general idea of comparing the now. There's a lot of work just in coming up with the data, to collect the data, aggregate the data, analyze the data, put it together, to get a sense of the cost of the now for the amount of outcomes that that cost gives us, or what that might compare against for this plan. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if that's being planned, but I think it's a great idea. Um, and I think you're right, it would have been really helpful if the project went to, to be able to say, here's what we have now, here's what we predict will be. Yeah. Every one of the systems completed the survey about these are the services that we provide now. Um, this is how we do X, Y, and Z. So they could kind of got that piece. We've also surveyed all the different memberships. You know, we should remember libraries that chose to take the survey about the important services and their satisfaction with it. So they have all that information from what one had a work group level. So that they they are using that to kind of start the process. Ultimately when they get their final recommendation, they will have some sort of cost estimate of what this new model will look like. So we'll kind of be vetted through that whole reasonableness in terms of cost. 
I guess uh, I should clarify. My question is about the now at the point in time where we're actually doing the comparison, right? Not the now from 2014 as that data. Well, part of, part of the now is different across the state of Wisconsin. So our now is totally different than what Southwest has or their now. So it, it's really difficult to, to establish a statewide now. Other than, you know, for ILS we have 14 different ILSs, I think, in the state. Because a couple of At systems. At least plus a bunch of random standards. Yeah. So yeah, there's there's some systems that share ILS between themselves. But you know, Marshall, um, they're on their own ILS. They're not part of the system ILS. So there are still some relatively Brown County has their own ILS. They are the system resource library, they have their own ILS. So there are some big not on the framework. So we can kind of say, okay, the, the ILS landscape looks like this right now. This is what it, we hope it will look like down the road. <coughs> the, other, the other complicating factor, at least in terms of finance, is that the state works on a two-year budget cycle. We work on a different budget cycle, most of us. You know, academics are very involved are working on an entirely different budget cycle. So there is no one point where you can say, let's compare apples to apples because everybody yeah, we, don't even, we don't even have the same budget line. We don't. Right. We don't call the stuff. We do the same stuff from system to system. So it, it, we couldn't compare dollars to dollars without a real in-depth audit. Because you you may charge for some stuff as part of a different membership fee that's not really an ILS cost, but it is an ILS cost. But it could be a technology. We could have it three different lines. And I think we discovered that with the project win conversations in terms of budget. We all have different ways of accounting. We all operate our own accounting systems. There are seven, well, 16 different accounting systems in the state or library systems. Because one Southwest has somebody else doing their books. But it's all different. We have different lines. We're all getting the same money from the same source. We come for it totally different. The other complicating factor is that I think there are libraries, individual libraries, that are contracting for services outside of their system, and in other places the system provides some of that stuff. I mean, there are libraries who use, like, say, city IT people, and other places use the system staff for that. So it really is it's a huge disparity in what you're getting and what you're paying for, and, and in some cases, in what the service looks like to your patrons, too. And she had her hand up for I had a boring question. Um, so every work group is coming up with its own model. Let's say seven work groups have a model that's feasible, um, cost effective, and two of them don't. Do we wait around for the other two? Do we start from scratch? Do we you know, I don't I don't mean to be the what if, but we wanna yeah. There there has been some conversation that we may actually be at a point with a work group or two down the road that they could actually implement <coughs> something and test it out because what their plan is is transportable from current governance structure to a new governance structure. So we might be able to do that. There, there may be a phasing of, okay, we can't afford X, Y, and Z right now but this is ultimately our goal. How do we get from here to there? You know, I, I, at one point there was a goal that Coland had out there that they should have one ILS for the entire state of Wisconsin. Whether or not that's realistic, and I don't think your group is going there, that's why they're doing the discovery piece. But maybe after 20 years of having that discovery layer, or 10 years, it's like, oh, we should all be doing this. This makes sense. You know, quite frankly, in 10 years, maybe every one of our ILS vendors goes belly up. And, you know, we're using Innovative and I mean, we're, we're all using the same product. But I've lived through ILS companies that have sold out to, you know, 
Ameritech and then they went belly up or they stopped doing a product. You know, some of the systems are using Polaris, which is now an innovator product. Are they going to continue to use that? Maybe not. So that's part of where we're at with this landscape is we're trying to build something that 10 years from now, we're not having to redesign the whole world again. It's going to be something that's flexible. Um, and it may change. And technology changes. You know, I'm, I've been in the library world 30 years, I think. One of the electronic resources had on one of their posters, and this is one of the takeaways, is that they want to digitize all these different formats, cassette tapes, <laughs> Betamax, reel to reel, <laughs> microfilm, microfiche. Oh, I've used every one of these formats in my library career. I'm getting too old. Um, but that but things have changed. You know, WizCat used to be a uh, microfiche product, mm -hmm. and then it went to a floppy disk product. That was revolutionary. Then it went to a CD product, and I think we had to have CD towers to fit that thing in there. Mm -hmm. um, and now it's on this online thing, and now it can communicate with other ILSs with this is all within the span of my library career. So we don't know, you know, where we might be. So hopefully by the time we're done with this, technology hasn't passed us by. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but we do need to be flexible. And we may have to do things slowly. We may not. I, I don't think we're going to be able to change everything overnight. We're not going to just walk into the room and say, we're in a new world today. You know, it's going to take some time. And, you know, like Teresa said, we're, we're working on two different budgets. The, the CPI right now is working on their, you know, their budget request to the, to the governor went in already. They're not going to be talking about it until next year. And we're, 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 we're in the middle of a process here. So if we go back into the budget cycle, we're looking at was it an 18, 19, 19, 21 budget? Yeah, 2019, 20, 21. 20, I gotta think about it. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Somewhere, somewhere <laughs> over there. Yeah, because the one they're working on now is 2017, 2019. Yeah. yeah. So that's that's where we're working in the library world. They, they work on a, a fiscal year from July 1 to whatever. We work January to December. So we're not going to necessarily be able to flip all those in time. And, and, and we may have services that look different. We may be talking to different people than what we're comfortable with right now. But that part of that change, and you know, some of the common people said, well, I really like my library system staff. I don't want them to go. I'm going to be talking to somebody different. Well, you generally could be talking to somebody else anyway. You know, eventually Marla's going to retire. She's got at least another 10 years, but... <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm a little closer than she is. <laughs> um, but, but people change. Services shouldn't change based on people. You should be able... I mean, I love messing around with building projects. I, I, I'll go into any library and tell them how they can rearrange your library. That's a passion of mine. I'm gone. The next person they hire doesn't have that passion. The service disappears. That shouldn't be the way it happens. But it does in many systems. You had it. Um, when you mentioned early on in your presentation about the patron caring or not caring about back information, you know, like, as long as I get my stuff on hand now, do you think standardizing some of the process, some of the rules, some of the things you know that we care so deeply about are going to be standardized to make it a little more efficient and less confusing. Because then even in our system, you can go from one library to another, have a grace period here, have a 25 cent fine there, and maybe this is a big great detail for that thing. Um, do you see some opportunity? for standardization, to make this work more efficient. <laughs> uh -oh. 
I think the answer is that, yeah, I think for a patron's perspective, standardization would be the thing. I also think going through Project WIN, that this is the detail level at which we got hung up. And, and, I, and I don't want to discount the importance of that conversation. Because I know that it impacts your day-to-day -day work at, at your library. But if, if the point at which we stop is, well, I want my DVDs to circulate for a week, and they want them to circulate for 10 days, and I just can't. I just can't. <laughs> that, that, to me, is impeding progress. And I, and I say that jokingly, but I saw that perspective when we went through Project WIN. It was that long period after our last meeting when everyone was all jazzed up about and we did those patron scenarios where we talked about all the great things we could do for our patrons. And then there was that long period over the summer where we all sat back and thought, oh, but that means I'm going to have to change. And oh, but what if I have to send this there? And oh, gosh, you know. So I worry about talking about that level of detail at this point in the process. Because I, I think we have to keep the big picture in mind. Yes? Do I personally feel like standardizing some of that stuff would help our patrons? Yeah, I do. Have I, when we looked at other systems, we looked. At, there was a nice article written um, about the UW systems, the um, technical college system, merging their their ILSs, and um, it, it has some nice perspective on that. So I'll send it to you. Um, but I think that we have to get people to think bigger picture. We really have to get to the point where we can say. And this is hard for library boards especially. You know, I'm looking at you because you brought this up earlier. And my board has said the same thing to me. It's hard for them to say, but we just bought, you know, Captain America. I don't want to send it <laughs> to Rhinelander or wherever. You know, yeah, we'll never see it again. Our patrons will never see it again. Our patrons will never see it again. And I try to, I try to remind them that the flip side works too, that our patrons get stuff all the time and they get it from Ashland and then, and then our guy who, who walked away with a staff full of DVDs, half of those were from Manitowish Waters, you know? Um, so so it's really hard to get people thinking about that. You know? when, when you did your research to other state libraries, I mean, we were looking at North Dakota yesterday. I, I in a way, like what they do. This is what it is. Here are your services. Here's the menu. This is what it is. You don't quibble over the five cents or the ten cents, or but you know what I mean. I understand this point. At this point, this process is not looking at that, but there has to be a plan in place of how you overcome that. And you can say big picture from Project Win. You can say big picture as much as you want, mm -hmm. but eventually it comes down to how yeah. do you deal with that. I mean, eventually you have to implement something. So in terms of ILS discovery, we have not proposed to say what ILS, and the reason we didn't. It's because we, every state that we looked at that was trying to implement something statewide, what happened was the small library said, I can afford that, I'll do it. And they were willing to give up some control. And the large library said, that's too much control for us to give up, and we can afford to go without you guys. <coughs> and so you get, oh, it's statewide, except Denver doesn't do it. Or it's statewide, except for Atlanta. And, you know, so you get patrons who don't have access to the largest collections in the state because those large libraries can afford to do what they want to do. And so that's why our model is regional. With a discovery layer that unites things, where regionally you can have your own ILS. Within limits. We're not going to support your 20-year-old Winnebago. So that's where, the, that's, that's, where this, but that's where this comes in. There has to be a minimum standard that you can participate. And if you don't participate, your patrons don't get to participate. So you may say, I don't want to share my stuff, but that means your, your patrons can't have everybody else's stuff. So they can't borrow everybody else's stuff. So there, there has to be a plan. But I think it's so early to talk about that level. Um, and, and so I, I hate to answer those questions, not because I don't think they're important, but because I don't want it to be a sticking point. Can I, can I say no fines on my kids' book? My library does that, and a lot of others don't. And to me, that's a great service, you know? Is that going to make me shut off everything for everybody? There has to be a higher level discussion first. And then you know it. I think we're really running into trouble, and we're just could run into trouble. And we can learn a lot from when. A lot of time went into that, and I'm sure a lot of people were frustrated about that. But now, let's learn from that. And you know, really what it is, it's selling. 
And most people don't even want to get into all that minutia stuff. But if it's selling it, and if you bring people along from the beginning, if that's one of the reasons why I'm here is how do we start selling it to the library board? Um, and, and you can explain to them, yeah, you're getting that off box. And really, as far as signs and checkout time, in three months, you know what? People are going to remember it. Anymore. They're going to get over it. But you have to sell it along the way so people don't just accept it or get it rammed down their throat, but they're excited about it. And I think one of the things the library board ran into with Lynn is that they were relying on a relatively new library director and an and ignorant president of the library board trying to explain this. And if we had somebody like in the system WVLS who could answer the questions and like just come to a meeting maybe once every nine months and say, yeah, this is where we are now and and, and selling us along the way, it would be it would be so much easier to complete. And yeah. so hopefully there'd be somebody from WPLS who could really come and explain it and answer questions because I know I know I won't. Erica does pretty well at it, but and he's building a library, so uh, <laughs> it would really help to have help. And I, I hear what you're saying on that. Um, and that's why PLSR has been trying to communicate so frequently. And sometimes, in some cases, they've been told they're communicating too much, too much detail. You don't have time to get through it all. I will use the example of John over here, though. If he went to every library in the system every, you know, every nine months, he wouldn't have time for the rest of his job because he's got 50 libraries to take care of. Which is why PLSR is trying to reach out to us as library directors to say, you know, you need to educate yourself. Well, the 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. 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 is really, really important that it's timely and consistent. And part of the problem with all kinds of different people doing it is that we tend to go off script. Like you know, John. <coughs> So I think Steph uh, Wills is very much aware of that and how that could be an issue. And I think they're looking at doing um, recording and opening up meetings, um, frequent meetings within a small amount of time to get the information out going forward. I know they talked about it, but I'm not sure if that's going to be the exact plan. But consistency, timely information. That's, I think, what everyone's looking for. By the time, you're right, by the time you would hit every board, the, the information you'd be sharing would be absolutely correct. One, one of the things, the steering committee is a public body. We are governed by open meeting law. So we, all our meetings are open to the public to sit in and listen. We do provide public comment at the beginning of the meeting. So if people want to make comments, they can do that, but they certainly are welcome to listen. They are all recorded. So again, they're up on the website. So as we move forward with some of these conversations at the steering committee level, that information will be out there and it will be public meeting. We started talking about how are we going to message this, inform the community when we get towards the end of phase three and when we're getting that final implementation plan put together. We've talked about having regional um, meetings so that we go across the state. Um, it, it's been talked about whether we about having a, a, a team do this. That's the same team at every meeting, so that that voice is the same. Because when I talk about the process, it's different than. Teresa talking about the process because she's at a, in a different setting. I know a lot more about the overall process and, and quite frankly, you know, she, she, she did it with Sherry up at her system. You know, Sherry's at a different level in terms of the process as well. So 
trying to communicate that and, and not necessarily saying, okay, we're going to be in Wausau. We may be in Rhinelander because we can touch libraries in the northern water system, libraries here, that it's more convenient for that. And then we may have one in wherever. So that it's, it's more of a regional kind of conversation. So we're not focusing on everybody just driving to their system. It may be you know, areas that are system overlap. Um, no, I just want to quick piggyback on that. Just as a person who sometimes feels like it's either too much information or way not enough information, and there never seems to be that happy middle. It, when that happens, you know, it's like kind of crying wolf. Here's more information. Here's another meeting. Here's another thing. Here's another set of minutes. If there's a way for you to market those meetings, that's, this is the one you need to come to. Don't miss this one. We won't ask you to come to another five meetings after this. This is the one. You know, it's a, this is the one where we've gone through this whole process. Maybe like today is the here's what we've been doing. This is where we're at. Great. But this is the one where here's our outcomes and here's what's being sent to the steering committee to be considered by API. And then we'll have one more before it goes to API. That's the kind of thing. It's like, okay, it's great that the transparency is out there. It's great that we can go back and review. But if you can tell us this is the one, be there. Don't don't mess with all the other stuff. That's what that would help me. Yeah, and, and it's going to be a, a, a logistical nightmare to try to figure out. Which one that is. No, yeah, I'm trying to schedule all that right. amongst how many other people are doing the presentation and wherever it is. But ultimately what we're going to try to do so far is get that out there far enough in advance so this is it folks mm -hmm. this is the these are the five ten days that we are going to be talking about this before we do X Y and Z with it so you need to be here yeah, yeah. I know it's a mess yeah no I, I hear you I mean I this is the third system I obviously did it with my own system but this is the third system that I've done this presentation with there's 17 systems, so um, I've kind of committed to saying yes. I'm going to be. I'm going to do this because it's important to be out there to communicate. If I I could not do it for 53 library board systems, I will if it's important enough. To, to try to, you know, if, if Ralph called me up and said, hey, you need to come to my board, talk to me about this, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, okay, I can do that. You know, in our case of Eau Claire, did that. I'm going to say, yeah, we can talk to you. That. It's a big deal. You know, I, you know, Deer Park is the smallest library in the state. There's you know, 250 people. But I don't know if I can, I'm not picking on Deer Park, but the political capital that they have this process is not the same as Royal Clare has and the understanding of and the impact. I mean there you know there's going there potentially is going to be huge impact on some libraries. And having them understand what we're doing is going to be very important. So we have to look at that. Great. I'm just wondering and you may not have a chapter on technology maybe statewide to be able to comparatively speaking, but I just wondered if the groups that have been involved in these presentations have in general been asking for more specificity than you were just able to provide at this point. You know, if, if and I'm trying to, to make an analogy perhaps between the groups and then what individual directors might encounter when they present to their own library board. If if individuals are concerned about specific areas or looking for a level of detail that just isn't available right now because of where the process is, and the response has to be, well, we don't know yet, trust us, essentially, that's, that's not going to be the best message at the best time, perhaps, going forward. Do you understand where I'm coming yeah. from? Uh, the, the, the standard company line is 
we're too early, too early in the process to know that. So that is, there are a lot of questions that we don't know. You know, we've had, I had somebody say, well, what, what are the systems going to look like? How many systems are there going to be? That's March of 2018-ish and beyond. We don't know. We don't, we don't know what the service models are or how that's all going to be in place. So, yeah, some of those answers are yes, it's really in the process. One of the takeaways from WLA is the people that communicated to myself or the project managers are that they are trusting the process that they're taking. They understand that it's early, but they understand that they're gathering the information. They're, they're communicating it out there. So they're trusting in that process. Because so, I think we encountered that to a degree also with Project Win, especially during the final push when we were trying to quote unquote sell or market um, going into the final vote, that that the, the emissaries, if you will, did not have all the answers, could not dot all the I's and cross all the T's. Um, and there were some um, there was some holdback because of that and some reluctance to engage. And I don't know that it was necessarily anybody's fault. It just was what it was. And I'm, I'm just concerned that that tipping point might be reached with this process. I'm wondering how it might, that tipping point might be avoided down to the final, final few months or those decision points. So the, the tricky thing with a project this big is that when we start talking to you early, like we're doing now, uh -huh. you know, we can't say how much is going to cost or is my system going to still exist. If we don't start talking to you now and we start talking to you a year from now, then you've missed the window of opportunity to get your input into the process. And then it's being just handed to you. So that, that's, the, that's the problem here. Is no matter which direction you go, there's not a good kickback. Um, the alternative, is Illinois. Yeah. You know, where the legislature says, don't care what you libraries want, this is what you're getting. And then you have to work to make that work. And that's what we're, at least me, I not speak to the steering committee, maybe Donald, Maddie, but that's what I'm trying to avoid here, is no library I'm put into the process. Right. Because the legislature's going to do what the legislature's going to do. You know, and there are library groups that are making good inroads in building those relationships and doing that advocacy work to, to get those relationships established so that we can have input into the process, but if ultimately what they decide is we're not going to fund <coughs> and then we're all scrambling, you know, then this is the problem. We want to be proactive. We want to say, we've looked at this. We're not saying we need to save you money. We're saying these are the services we provide that are important to our communities and these are what we need to do to continue to make that happen. So, you know, that's the, the ultimate problem is I can't come up here and say your ILS is going to cost you Ten percent less than it does now, or twenty percent more, or whatever it is, because it's too early. But if I don't talk to you about this now, and you come to me a year from now and you say, "What? You're not talking about a state ILS? Why aren't you talking about a state ILS?" Then it's kind of too late for me to incorporate. So it really is the catch twenty-two. It is a matter of trusting the process and trusting the process, right? And that's why there's a hundred people working on it, and that's why there's a website full of way more detail than you could possibly want unless you're actually involved in it, um, to make it transparent. And by the way, Jen, hopefully LBNL needs a statement to the legislative day, like this week. <laughs> <laughs> you were talking about it at your December meeting, right? Uh, Candy can needs it like <coughs> next week. <laughs> I was waiting until I got it. It's on my to-do list. I was waiting until I got back to WLA. I'm sorry, I couldn't believe Trust me. <laughs> it's always got to be in one heckler in the crowd. <laughs> um, this presentation today is a perfect example of changing in midstream. When we started phase two, this was not even on the radar screen to come and do these toolkit presentations. The toolkit wasn't even an idea. But we heard from people from libraries, what do I tell my board? I need to give them some. Some of them are asking. I need some, some information. This is the result of that too. We're rolling up this thing on, on the fly in terms of some of that stuff so that we
we are responsive to what the library community needs for information. And it may change as we go forward. So we're, we're not saying this is the only way we're doing this process. This is not the only way we're communicating this. We're rolling this out and doing different things. Um, so yeah, we are trying to anticipate whatever hiccup we may have in terms of communication moving forward, but we may not know. And that's why do not ever hesitate to contact somebody from PLSR. If you have a question, comment, keep them good, bad, just say, hey, great job. We need to know that. Project managers get the information. If it's important for steering to deal with, it comes to us. We, we have a regular thing on our agenda to communication from the library community. So if you have concerns or questions, get them to, to us so that we can deal with them. We want to deal with them now. We don't want to deal with them in March 2015. So no, it doesn't pay to save up a bunch of questions. Fire them away when you have them. You guys were much more lively than you are. <laughs> <laughs> much more, more lively than my system, but they hear me all the time. So, um, if you want my card, you can contact me directly, and I can also, you know, chat about this process as a steering committee chair. So, I just if you want to take one. I've got plenty. Um, like I said, please do not hesitate to contact somebody if you have a question. If you, if you, don't think it's a bad question or a dumb question or whatever. If, you're, if you don't understand, I'm sure there's somebody else out there that doesn't understand it as well. And, and we need to make sure that, that everybody understands why we're doing this and what's going on. I have a question for you. There's so many different aspects to the whole thing. What happens if some say, okay, I like this, 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 and this, but I'm not going to do that. What happens? That, if, if we run into, okay, let's say this piece of this project doesn't seem feasible from a funding perspective or a political perspective or whatever, that may get delayed. As long as it doesn't necessarily impact the overall project scope. So, trying to think of it. So if all of a sudden somebody says, well, we're not going to share servers for, for technology, that may change a bunch of different models that we have to. So we, we'll, as we move forward towards the end of this, we'll see what makes sense and see, again, where we get the feedback. People may be pushing back a little bit. And we may have to readjust or we may have to just wait a little bit. The other difference in this, I think, is from Project Win, is that this isn't a buy-in. Right? It's not like Project Win where we're all paying into our ILS and we all have to kind of vote whether we're going to do it or not. There's already, I'm sure, some <coughs> that your library is using and some services that your library is not using. I know that's the case in my library. Some things we just don't need or take advantage of for whatever reason. Um, you know, but the systems do what they're going to do. So just you don't, you know, I mean, that that comes back to your library's administration, I think, to a certain extent. But this is at the DPI level. This isn't us. Like, this isn't going to come to a vote by the individual library. This is going as a recommendation to DPI. So, you know, what they end up doing with it is always oh, a big question, but the information that feeds into that is when the library kind of gets to, you know, get to vote on the state budget, you know. So, a little different perspective than what we went through with Project Win, where we were really you know, kind of selling it and trying to get leverage to vote one way or the other, selling it or not selling it as the case may have been, I don't know, but um, you know, this is a little different situation. Some of this is going to require changes in the stat state statute, so that's a whole. A lot of work for you. I have a question. I have a question. So if a uh, recommendation from the steering committee goes to DPI for the model, and they disagree. They, they are in a position to change up, tweak, adjust, refine, or what? What? Possibly. Okay. I mean, it, it. There's just no guarantee. It's there, not an absolute. Well, you're still recording. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we are. 
our recording then. <laughs> there, there, since some of this is going to be a legislative process, as with all legislative processes, things can change at multiple points within this process. So we're, we're going to try to offer up our best recommendation. But, you know, there, um, you know I think the, li the return of library materials bill was a good example. There was a lot of give and take in that before a, a final bill received consensus enough to move forward from the people that were willing to sponsor that bill. So how it started was a little different. But I think it would, we as a library community have a shared vision of things moving forward. I think that's going to help. Um, the DPI staff are liaison to each one of the work groups. So they're part of that information dissemination gathering process. Um, the project managers do touch base with DPI staff on a semi-regular basis. Like I said before, we have had one presentation with uh, Dr. Peters and his department-level cabinet. And he was at that Q&A. We're planning on going back sometime in the spring to have another update with him. Um, he's clearly fully engaged based on those two, the, the presentation we did to the cabinet and attending that, that meeting. He's, he's engaged. He's following what's going on. So I, I think that's a good thing from his perspective. It's not something that they're just saying, oh, yeah, we've put a committee together. They're making regular um, reports to COLAN, which is the advisory group that works with the governor and the state superintendent. So that, it's out there. So hopeful that once we come up with a recommendation that we, we have a clear message outcome that you know people will support. Key elements of this process going forward continue to be the relationship building that individual librarians and board members are doing with the legislators in their home districts. We're going into our biennial budget session at the first of the year. There are library committee members in both the assembly and the press that will to have contact. Um, I, was, I was teasing John to a degree about the information that the WLA Legislative Committee, John is one of his, his the liaisons from DLSR to the Library Association Legislative Committee. And we are going to be looking seriously at what handout we put into the hands of our members who attend legislative meetings as we first, because just as these kinds of meetings, and what Vicki was talking about, are key to grassroots information and buy-in. What we present to the legislators starting at Legislative Day and, and in these informal conversations that we're going to have are, is, is also important. And we all need to be on the same page and, and know what the key takeaways are so that we're all um, sharing a common message. Whether we know every detail or not, whether we are all necessarily 100% um, comfortable in our own right with not knowing every detail at this time, we need to be very positive in And all of those contacts, just as with the budget items or anything else, eventually will give us the political capital that will help us to get done what needs to be done after March. Yep. And, and this process is on the radar screen at a different level. There was a lean study of library systems conducted by the DPI prior to this process beginning. That was conducted because a state legislator put in a provision in the state budget that the Department of Administration should do a lean study of public library systems. The governor vetoed that provision, said that's something that the DPI <coughs> has the statutory authority to do, and they did do that. So there are people out there that are aware that this process is going on. 
many of you probably aren't comfortable going up to your state representative and saying, hey, this is what it's all about. That's why that, that information sheet is there. So it's going to be a, a kind of here's what the process is about, here's where we're at kind of thing. Again, we don't want to make it dated. We want to kind of keep it current and relevant. And if you want more information, here's the website, and here's the person to talk to so that we give them some information about who, who, who are some good contacts to talk about this. And I think for that library return, return of library materials bill, they had key people to contact so that they knew who to, to talk to when they had questions. And that's what we need to make sure as part of this whole process that we're aware of questions. And then the questions that you may encounter as you encounter your legislators are in turn funneled back to John and also funneled back to the WLA Legislative Committee so that we know what's out there on the radar and what information um, might need to be supplemented with a few additional uh, facts and, and context. Yeah, and in the same way, if you take this toolkit to your board and they have a bunch of questions that you can't answer, Funnel them back to us so that we can help you with that. Absolutely. We don't we don't want you making stuff up on the fly. I don't I don't want to make stuff up on the fly either. And and there are questions I can't answer. And I and I'm I'm involved in this process. Because again, it's maybe too early. I don't know what every single worker has been doing. That you know, I, I don't know all the interconnectivity with that at this point. So you know, there, there isn't one fountain of knowledge you can have. The Will Project Mentors are probably the closest. But, you know, we want to make sure we try to be as open as possible with the public. Gotcha. Another question along the lines of the legislative involvement and awareness, and that comes down to we have a couple of examples now over the last several years of sometimes a single library and a single key district being able to influence activity and action at the state level in the legislature. Um, that could create some positive change or some, some negative change, depending on who's looking at it and what their sentiment is. For this particular project, if it comes down to maybe not just that one that kind of extreme hyperbolic case, but um, maybe a handful of libraries in key districts that really are just, for whatever reason, not about this. Is that being thought about to be incorporated in planning and consideration during the CLSR process, phase three, finalization, making sure that we have a really good sense of that buying and ownership across the libraries in the state? Or is that something that transitions after the recommendation and kind of falls on these guys last night to, to work with them? We're, it's, it's back here, back of our heads, but it's too early in the process to know how people are feeling about this from a I really love it or really hate it kind of feel because we don't have a model up there yet. So there's nothing really for people to react to. I, I I've not encountered any, I don't want them touching anything conversation. They shouldn't even be doing this. I haven't heard any of that yet. So I think that's probably going to come, it could occur, actually I should say probably, I say it could occur down the road when we have a model that's developed. I think the other aspect of that is that in building these models, each of our committees, you know, we had this group of volunteers who wanted to participate in the process and we, we selected committee members to invite to our specific committees. And when we did that, we thought consciously, do we have a small library person, do we have a big library person, do we have a teaching person, do we have an academic person, do we have a... So that we could try to get those perspectives. And, um, and that's so that, because if we knew that if, if my whole committee was all small libraries, Whatever we build is not going to be relevant to the rest of the state. So um, I don't want to spend time on this and have it be something that only serves a particular constituency. I want to I want to think it makes sense for everyone. And so we built that into the process when we had this many people involved in it.
trying to get those perspectives. That, that doesn't mean that it can't happen. It doesn't mean that the group of libraries can't say, I hate that recommendation and we're going to fight it. But at least this way from the ground up, we've got those perspectives. We want to say, well, we talked about that when we had so-and-so on the committee because they represented the you know, large library or whatever. Overlaying the legislative process and the top of the down the road, you know, there will need to be some consideration, not just the size of the library, but the size of the system. But that we are, that our key legislators in, in, in leadership positions are hearing from the people in the district so that this is supported. Because ultimately, they're going to be asking, will this change the amount of resources that are coming to my district? And will I have anybody from the libraries in my district on my doorstep with their hair on fire? And if I agree to this because it benefits my district, will I be enough aware of how it affects other districts so that my leader won't take me over his knee because he's getting a lot of flack from other places and I was only advocating for my point of view. So this gets to be a really complicated topic as you go down, down the road. And the important thing is, is that at the right time, you have the right people talking to the right legislators because they build up these relationships and, and they're not starting from scratch. So that's a way of saying go to the library. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take a pause. <laughs> we'll take a pause. Thank you all for your excellent questions. Thank you. Thank you. Josh, we're supposed to Thank you, everyone, for attending today's stage.